I don't know how you can know what's going on if you don't have some fundamental ideas here of the code. You have to crack the code in that way. So I hope that makes some sense to you, but we're in the, the pull of upward and the pull of outward. This is why I keep saying to people that it's important that you realize that you don't just stay stuck in the within message. Don't be satisfied. God's in me. The kingdom is in me. All of this is in me because what's in you wants to come out of you. Well, he tells us, I explain. And the, there you go. There you go. And these are the tools that are being given to us to help us to transform and to really release what is imprisoned in us. We're not the prisoner. God is the prisoner in you. That's why we can form so many gods out here because nobody has really had any experience with the true God. Anyway, I guess we're on. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. All right, here we go. Third. It's our third class on, based on the teaching of the intelligence of the heart. A lot of this material is influenced by uh, Hart Math, who's been around for two or three decades now and has done tremendous work in proving this idea that the heart is an intelligence uh, system uh, of its own. So we've kind of moved away a little bit from New Age. I think New Age has had its day. I appreciate it, it was a, a good thing. But I think we're moving into a different level of more spiritually scientific level of things. I think things can be uh, more proven that at one time was just taken to granted as a belief with no proof to it. Uh, if you think of how much of metaphysics, how it was taught 150 years ago, 200 years ago, there was no proof much in it at all. Fillmore really tried because Charles Fillmore, the founder of Unity, had a more scientific leaning. And so did Holmes, both of them, about the same time was developing these two different groups, which ended up being Unity and Science of Mind. But both of them were smart men who had a kind of scientific angle to spirituality, which was very different to the religion of the day, which was against any science whatsoever. Science was of the devil, any science at all. Uh, so therefore, they wanted to keep us in the dark and not prove anything until we die and go to heaven. Then we can understand it. <laughs> they really t will tell you that. I've been told that. You don't need to know this. When you die, you can ask Jesus when you get to heaven. So do you realize how they have given power to death as a way to heaven? They say Jesus is the way to heaven. No, dying is the way to heaven for these people. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think this is an important <laughs> thing that we are, are doing here. Also, I'm very... Uh, influenced by this little book called The Heart's Code uh, by Paul Pearsall. Uh, it's uh, new findings about cellular memories, their role in the mind, body, spirit connection, and does wonderful talks on the heart. So I'm taking several things together because I can't get caught in one thing or I'm going to get have an issue with heart math. Um, there's some limits to what we can do with heart math publicly. So I'm trying to just uh, not totally be with that. All right, first week, we learned heart focused breathing. Okay? Is, are anybody practicing heart focused breathing? Yes. Good, okay. And heart focused breathing was. Breathing in through the heart. 
So when you do heart focused breathing, your chest should be rising. Whereas when you do deep breathing, your stomach rises. But when you do heart focused breathing, you bring your, your consciousness to the heart area and you breathe in the heart. So you want to do that with me about two or three times? We'll do the uh, heart focused breathing. You're going to breathe a little deeper than usual. I wouldn't over get into the breathing that it takes your attention, but just do it a little deeper than normal breath is. So we're going to breathe in and chest comes out. Hold and exhale. Now you can choose your exhale through your nose or mouth. I'm choosing to do all nose. Breathing in. And out. Now the third time I'm going to have you to do it. But before you do it, I want you to think of something you're concerned about today. Just some little something. Maybe you've got a concern about something going on in your life. And just think about it. Something maybe not so pleasant. A worry, a concern of some kind. I want you to get that fixed in, into your mind. Okay. Now I want you to do the heart-focused breathing. Breathe in. Hold. Exhale. Now, could you think of that thing you were thinking about and do that heart focused breathing at the same time? Could you? Yeah. No. You could think of the, the, that bad thing and do heart focused breathing all at the same time. When you're breathing, you disconnect from the brain. So if it worked for you the way it's supposed to work for you, you had the thought, it's a worry thought. Okay, today I've got to, I have an issue today I've got to face. I'm not, I really do, something I'm not looking forward to, a little thing. But I, when I did the breathing, I, it, I couldn't think about it. It went away. And that's what heart-focused breathing is for. It is for you to uh, have uh, resilience to get you out of that worry faster, to break the cycle of the worry. You want, let's do it one more time. So again, think of something or that same thing, a concern you have. Well, think about the world. Aren't you a little worried about the world right now? Concern? How about the war? Well, then find something if, if you want to. Okay, so uh, you that have something, now I want you to do breathe in through the heart. Hold and out. Again, breathe in through the heart. And out. So, tell me your experience. Thought disappears. Thought disappears. That's why sometimes if I have something does a pain, like a massage therapist or somebody does a pain thing with me, I find myself holding my breath, which makes the pain worse. If I go back to my breathing, the pain is less because I've disrupted those particular pathways where the brain is traveling to whatever's hurting my leg or my shoulder to my brain. So that's why breathing is so good. It's a disconnect process that, that basically uh, happens for you. Last week we learned accessing heart intelligence um, by learning resilience. Anybody remember what is resilience? Hmm? Yes. 
It is the capacity to prepare for, recover from, adapt in the face of stress, challenge, and ad adversity. Okay. So resilience carries more of a preventive slant to it. It helps you to keep yourself in a place so that when things hit you out of nowhere, it doesn't hit you as hard. Okay. We learned that every emotion you experience, whether or not you are aware of it, has an effect on the body and on your resilience. Every emotion immediately causes changes in your body. We learned coherence, the key to building resistance. Resilience, I'm sorry. Coherence is a state of optimal functioning in which your physical systems are in sync and balanced with your heart, mind, and emotion, and very important, your nervous system, hormonal immune systems are all working in coordinated manner. So we call it centering, just becoming centered in that. In that exercise, we learn quick coherence in which we focused our attention on the area of the heart. Imagined our breathing passing in and out through your heart of the center of your chest. So this is exactly what we did with heart focused. Then breathing in an attitude of calm and balance. So I had you to think about something to be concerned, worry about whatever, I'm gonna ask you to do the opposite. I want you to go somewhere in yourself that makes you experience being calm and balanced. Maybe it was a moment on the beach somewhere or wherever, whatever comes up to you that gives you a sense of calm and bring that into the focus of your inner sight. And now breathe that vision that you're holding into the cells for memory. And these are mostly going to the cells of the muscle. It's called muscle memory and cellular memory. So now, even in your unconscious mind, you have access to that calm experience you just breathed and imprinted into the, into the memory part of yourself. In other words, you're going to remember more to get calm, more than get upset. Getting upset is a reaction. Being calm is a chosen action. And most of us live what we call reactive lives. It's called in Kabbalah, reactive lives. It means that we just react without thinking. But being proactive means conscious living, or what's called today mindfulness, the movement of mindfulness. And that's today's lesson. So let's start with the quote. And this is from Doc Childer, who is started the Heart Math Institute. It says, when we react to life from the head without joining forces with the heart, it can lead us into childish behavior that we don't respect in ourselves. Hmm. It is true. That, that really is reactive, right? It is. As opposed to being able to respond to what's going on. Right. And this is why I've tried so hard to teach these stages of infancy, adolescence, and, and adult, spiritually. And I quote the scripture a lot to you, but it says, um, putting away our childish things and growing up into love. It starts out, what is that scripture? It's uh, until we come to the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ unto a full stature, being no more as children, being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. The apostle Paul as a grown man said, when I became a man, I put away my childish things. Now, he wasn't talking about his childhood. 
He was talking about some of the ways that he acted and thought as like a child, a child who wants its way, a child that wants to be in control, a child that manipulates and controls. He grew out of that and became a spiritual adult. So even now, if we're not careful, we act childish. If an event comes up, some, some things that we blow out of proportion, uh, which can happen right here at Heartlight sometimes. Not often, thank goodness, but once in a while, some little issues come up and then we get childish about it. We get hurt, we get defensive, we pout. We do all these things like a child would do instead of becoming the spiritual adult that we should be and look at it from a higher spiritual place in which that we can grow and mature. That makes sense to you? Yes. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I was in a workshop one day and my daughter was with me, she was 12, and we kind of got into a little fight and what we were working on then was age and maturity and my mentor came over and said, oh yeah, we need to just look at what age you're working from and it turned out that both of our three-year-olds were interacting uh, and we had to release the stress uh, on that to diffuse that. It was the most amazing thing. It turned around in seconds. Very good. Excellent. Yes. So, um, you know, we're trying to set a level here at Heartlight for people who are moving out of their adult stage and becoming responsible co-creative adults. And that's why some people don't fit to come in here because if they still want to play church, you know, we used to say that. We're playing church. Uh, you can play church uh, uh, in, a, in a way that a child would, would approach the whole thing. So um, I want to say for all of us, where much has been given, much is required. We're held to a, a, a level and a standard here of all the work that you have done and represent. Some of you for decades have been in something spiritual, spiritual teachings, following spiritual paths, whatever else that you have done. And you have come here to Heartlight at a certain level that you must be responsible for. Hmm. Gossip, telling tales, controlling, manipulating, these are all very immature, childish things. So we want to handle these things like spiritual uh, adults do. If forced to choose, would you, would those who know you say you are a person of the head or the heart? Would they describe you as a person who, one, makes decisions based on rational and analytical consideration of issues involved, or someone who tends to be more intuitive and instinctive. Now to be honest, how I would answer that is both. I'm not here gonna to try to tell you that I'm 100% in a place where I'm constantly operating from my heart and from my intuition and guidance. I can go there easier than I used to but I can't tell you that it, I'm 100% that way. There are times I'm caught off guard that I end up reacting. And that's where something is so important called awareness and self-observation comes in. If you can catch yourself, and what do you do when you catch yourself? Heart-focused breathing. Because then that makes you resilient, right? And, co and, and then you start being coherent with your, with your higher system of things and you come out of it. You come out of the emotional body taking over because when the emotional body takes over, it will knock you out consciously. Trust me. How many times have you said things you wish you had not said or done something you wish you had done? If I'd have just thought that over again, I would not have done that or said that. You did that because of reactionary action without thinking. I know we've all done that at some, some point in our life, that we've done something that we would, 
would have said it differently or can't take it back or something like that. Uh, and that's not a judgmental thing. It's a part of humanity as we know it, that we do that. Unfortunately, we've made our spirituality more specialized. It's something we cut out a few minutes for. <laughs> Maybe we cut out 20 minutes a day or twice a day we meditate. Then we come Wednesday, some of us for two whole hours, wow. Then we come Sunday, another two hours or whatever it is. And that's where our spirituality is kind of cut up. But heart math is telling us how we bring this into becoming a heart intelligent life. And if we do that, it will upgrade our life as we know it. So to do that, like everything else, you have to practice the presence. You have to practice the present. You have to practice being your own observer. If I had you to imagine in your mind's eye right now uh, a big red apple, you're not that apple. <laughs> you're, who's looking at the apple? How do you, who's seeing that apple? How would you see the apple? The apple's not making you see itself. You're seeing the apple because you're observing that. So these are the things that quantum theory and teachings have given us some real proof that works even on a scientific uh, level. So you have to decide, am I going to be a head person or a heart person or probably kind of both right now? I'm doing my best to stay in my heart but sometimes my head just takes over. And when the, now the, here it is, when the heart is, is, is uh, taking over, you're in a state of feeling. If the head is taking over, you're in a state of emotion. It's two different things, they're not the same thing. Having, oh, I feel to do this, or having an emotional uh, charge is a whole different thing. And that's why I say the emotion will knock you out consciously if you're not careful. Feelings are good. The heart is a feeler. She feels. <coughs> the feminine has much better feeling systems than sometimes the, the male or masculine part has, or in us, the left and right brain. Doesn't have to be man and woman but it can be the right and the left brain. The left brain more thinks, analyzes. The right brain is more intuitive and creative and more artistic. So all of that is going on uh, within us. And we're either in the dominant right brain or the dominant left brain most of the time. That's why uh, in some energetics we work so hard to try to get people to use tuning forks to cross what divides the right and left brain, which is hundreds of millions of nerves called the course, uh, course, um, col uh, corpus. corpus callosum. The corpus callosum. So it's like a, it's like a, uh, a divider between right and left brain. But when you use tuning forks and vibration, it doesn't know there's a corpus callosum there. It doesn't know to stop here. The, the right brain star, stops and the left starts and so on and so forth. It just goes right across the corpus callosum and right gets more into left and left gets more into right and you become whole brain. That's called whole brain system. And that's why tuning forks especially, bowls, anything that is vibration. But you don't want to attach music to it. Music is an emotional thing. Music uh, is what it is, but music always attaches me to some emotion of love or <laughs> hurt or sadness. Music, I, I listen to music, sometimes it's sad music, sometimes it's happy music. All kinds of things come up with music with me. Now, you that was here yesterday for the drumming thing, that was so good and so well yesterday because it was just pure drumming and rhythm and beat. There was no melody 
to it at all. So the emotional body had to settle down. Huh? And we almost became coherent with the beat and with the rhythm. And that's why drumming and, and that kind of thing is, is such a powerful uh, thing to do. Uh, heart may have its own unique way of thinking and feeling that is no less important than the brain's way of dealing with the world. The head is potential for logical brilliance. No doubt about it, you can really be smart up here. Some people are just intelligent people, as far as a world description of intelligence. They're just smart that some people have photo, photographic minds. People have tremendous intellect and teaching. But again, without the heart, that does not do us much good. In fact, if we continue that direction of putting in knowledge into the brain only, at some point, it will make you weary. And that's a scripture. Much more, much, too much knowledge makes one weary. And that's why I have to watch it. Sometimes if I get into a lot of books and I'm reading and reading and reading and reading, I have to pull back. Because I know at the point where I literally am, my brain is hurting, <laughs> that I'm over, over intellectualizing that part of me and I have to pull back and, and do something else that is not using my intellect whatsoever. Even mindless television can help you. You know, if you don't want to meditate or go out into nature, those are things you can do. But the main thing is to do something that turns the intellect off, that it doesn't have to, to overthink anything. A brain unlocked by its heart can enter into a lethal alliance with the body. So it is, and I've, the, the, the brain being masculine, heart being feminine, in balance, has an effect in the body. The word for body is soma in the Greek. That's where soma energetics was born. Because I want to include the physical body as an energy system and not just having one. But this interesting about this word soma, and all these words that are translated into English are from Greek, and Hebrew, and Aramaic. And the thing about English is we don't have word endings like so many other languages do, meaning that most words in Spanish even has a masculine word ending or a feminine word ending or a neutral word ending. Most languages do, except English, maybe German, which are very languages of engineering and left brain stuff like that, you know. So Soma though has a neutral one. So it is the neither male or female. Isn't that a kick? Because we see the body as the man and woman, male and female, and it's the thing that isn't. It's neutral. It's waiting for a signal from one or the other. Either the brain or ego is going to use your body, or either your higher spirit or soul is going to use your body. But the body is, is the result of what's going on between the yin and the yang, the male and the female, the right and the left. See, and that's why uh, just physical healing doesn't do a whole lot. You know, I was raised in that Oral Roberts thing, laying hands on people, uh, healing them and all of that. I'm not saying I've not seen some stuff, I have. I've seen what might be called, I guess a miracle or two, but it's not been foolproof. You know, I would be drugged into those tent revivals, there'd be thousands of people in them, thousands. And maybe 25 got healed. But what about the 
thousands that didn't get healed. So it didn't work for everybody. And I, I begin to pick that up very early. Why is this not working for everybody? Why, what makes a person not get healed? But anyway, and then, and then when you go from religion into physical healing, then you go into, then you go into um, medical, which is geared toward uh, the body. Hmm? Medication, surgeries, all this kind of stuff. They try to meet your issue at the body. Well, that's not working either. Nothing is working that is starting with the body because the body is neutral. So as more of our authentic spiritual self awakens and uses the body, the body will take that on. But if the, if the other part of us, the brain, is using our body, then also we end up with mental illness, psychological issues, depression, all these kind of things, I believe, come from the origin of the fact that the brain without the heart is using the body. Therefore, it is, it is, uh, it is causing, um, it's causing, it causing imbalances that end up chemically, mm -hmm. hormonal, and I think that's exactly where most mental so-called challenges should be treated is from that level. That's why I believe in counseling and things like that. I believe everybody that can do it and afford it should have some kind of coaching. If you, you don't have to go to a paid psychologist, but coaching. I'm doing that right now. I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm at a great crossroads, Soma's gone. Uh, we're trying to do a new platform, trying to rearrange what money, all kinds of stuff's going on for, for us right now. And I'm a little like, mm, so I decided, I, I said, Spirit, but send me to the right one. And that's not easy to find somebody. I've had some real duds, but I'm telling you, I got drawn to this one person. And he is so, he gets me. He's spiritual. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm really so glad that I felt I needed somewhere I could just be David and not be reverend, minister, that kind of thing. I, had, I wanted to leave all of my labels out, and I'm enjoying it. And fortunately, I found somebody that takes Medicare. So I'm not having to pay for it either. So uh, that's, that's I, I don't know why I'm telling you that, because I'm not trying to hide anything from anybody. But I want you to know that even we in this position sometimes need a little counseling and coaching and whatever. And um, uh, I consider myself a pretty good coach, and I'm going to start opening myself more here for any counseling or anything you want to do as your, as your spiritual leader. I don't think we uh, make that available here enough. But some of you may need to talk a little bit and to get some things off your chest, and we can go through some things. Anyway, I'm trying to get that worked out somehow. Time. It's always about time, isn't it? In this in this dimension and realm, whatsoever. So, the heart has its own way in which it thinks and feels, and the head has its own way. A brain unchecked by the heart can enter into a lethal, a lethal alliance with the body. That's where we left it, and that's why we have something called cardio-sensitive. Awaken the brain to its partner that thinks in a different way. I don't want this to come off like we're bad-mouthing the brain. <laughs> don't mean to do that. And I don't think women in the women's movement should be bad-mouthing men. <laughs> I'm not for that either. I think we, we tend to get so extreme about everything that all of a sudden we need this enemy on the other side uh, and we don't need to do that. We, we need both of these things. It's in the balance of them working together that's going to make uh, the difference. 
So cardio sensitive is interesting. This would be you who are calling yourself empathic. This is different than having spiritual discernment and having cardio sensitivity. That means that you're very sensitive to your environment. You walk into an environment and you immediately are connected to the vibe. If something's not in harmony with you, you're going to feel it. When you walk into a building, an office, a house, a church, wherever you go, you are cardio sensitive. Most of the sensitivity is in the skin. That's why your patches work. You that are in the patches. Because the skin has so many sens sensories and sensitivity to the rest of the body that, uh, that it's important that we realize that this is getting to what I call to the cellular level now. Spirituality is, has less mysticism. Yeah, I think it's leaving mysticism and it's becoming more cellular. In other words, I think things now are going to be less mystical and more understandable. Are you with me on that? Understand it. So how many times do I hear people say, oh, I got chills. I got goosebumps. Someday I'll get, I, I looked this up. It's actually got a name. Erectatitis or something like that. But it, yeah, it really is a name of what happens uh, when that happens. And you get this chill, this, you know what I'm talking about. We call them Holy Ghost goosebumps <laughs> back in the day. But we get them, and, and I've told you that that's the story of Tim and Connie and I over there in that house falling down next door. Uh, and I didn't want this place. Oh, my God. I thought, are you kidding me? It was so bad over there. I mean, it was, all, it was really bad. There was dead mice in the trash. There was... No way, but when the three of us hit something and all three got those chills, it changed. Mm -hmm. We were cardio sensitive. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a spiritual thing, it was about this land. Mm -hmm. It was about this location. That's what we were feeling. That's what happened to me is I was given a love for the land. Not the buildings that were in terrible shape. Didn't even matter at that moment. I knew this was the land, the place for me to be. So just thought I'd share that mm -hmm. with you. In Proverbs 20 and 5, mm -hmm. a plan in the heart of man is like water in a deep well, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Mm -hmm. Plan in the heart of man is like water in a deep well. But it'll stay in the well if you don't draw it out. So the discovery of what's called the little brain in the heart. That's what they call it. The little brain in the heart now gives us new meaning to the phrase and the role it can play in our lives. It doesn't use the slow filters of past experience to make its decisions. That's very important. I'm going to read it again. It doesn't use the slow filters of past experiences to make its decisions. How many experiences are you having in a day was based on something that happened to you? I hear it all the time. Oh, I've done that before. Oh, I trusted that before. Hmm? The single eye of the heart, the state of harmony that we create for ourselves in heart-brain coherence, accesses what's true for us in the moment of the situation. So if you're if something's happened to you, just I gotta go think about it. Uh-uh. 
wrong thing. And here's the thing. When you look back on it, you're going to know you knew right then. How many of you have ever thought yourself out of something you knew to do that later you knew that you knew to do it? <laughs> but I can't right now. But I don't have enough money right now. But I'm overextended right now. All of this chatter that goes on in the brain and all the while you had that initial uh, moment that the heart knew. So I'm, I want to read that again. A, the single eye of the heart, the state of harmony that we create for ourselves. How we create that ourselves? Through heart-focused, coherent breathing state by practicing it. It is true for us in the moment of our given situation through, I call IRA, intuitive right action intuitive right action. Now it takes practice to get to that place that you can trust that without overthinking it. Rather than thinking through a list of the pros and cons or weighing out the probability that an experience of the past will repeat itself in the present, the heart intelligent knows instantly what's true for us in the moment. The brain prays for, the heart prays what? The brain prays for things, the heart prays what, it says here. Now we can interpret what is. Well, it does. I, that's right. It, it prays what is true. Like here at Heart, like every Sunday we try to pray for what is true, that, that that person is created whole. So we're not praying for them to become whole. We are praying they are whole. So the brain prays for things because it is built on a belief of lack. I don't have it. I need to get it. And the heart says, I'm connected to what is. And therefore we pray what? Truth. Cardio contemplation. Good word. Means to ponder with your heart about our connection with and meaning of our world. Whoa. That's a big one right now. I think people, including myself sometimes, really get knocked out consciously by trying to think about the state of the world. And I get nowhere with that. If not, I get worse. I lose my faith in something bigger than myself. I lose connection with that all things work together for good. I'll say that. In fact, we sing it. I know all things work together for my good. We can say and sing this stuff till the cows come home. And it means nothing at all until we can actually make this live or live in heart-based uh, in intelligence. So to ponder with our heart about our connection with the, with the meaning of our world. Now, let me give you an example. I'll give you mine. When I'm in my head, I, I see nothing but injustice. I see craziness. I see all this political nonsense that's going on. That's just what I see. And I don't like it. And it makes me feel good. And I get pissed off about it. And I... No one understand human beings, how you can do this to each other. I mean, there's a whole scenario of places I can go to. But if I really take my time to preach what I practice, 
which is interesting once in a while. Think about doing what you're preaching. Uh, and I go from a heart place. Here's what my heart told me. You are seeing centuries, decades of human pathology erupting on the body politic. Whew. I said, no, my brain wasn't telling me that. My brain's telling me it's over. This is crazy. We've lost it. We'll never get back again. We're all nuts. We're going to kill each other. <laughs> and my heart said, no. You're seeing exactly what you said you wanted to see and you've been praying for. That I'm letting everything that has been pushed down in the collective unconsciousness begin to emerge and be no more hidden. So I get a breakout, which I did recently. I had, I, in fact, I, this is a good story. I had a weird thing on my back. Tim took a picture of it with the camera. It didn't like, look, didn't look mean to me. So I go down here to the dermatologist down the street. I go, and I thought, oh my God, it's cancer. Oh my God, you know the brain, just, you know how it does. <laughs> um, and the, and the, the doctor, who I really like, started laughing. She said, well, that's a wisdom spot. Mm. Oh, wisdom spot. Oh. <laughs> it's something older people can get because of their age. And she has named them wisdom spots. Talk about a shift in perception. I went from, oh, my God, I've got cancer to, oh, my God, to I've got a wisdom spot. <laughs> Is it a mole or what it look like? I don't know. It's a little brown spot thing. I don't know. You want me to take off my shirt and show you? <laughs> but anyway, um, that's the difference between how the brain works and how the heart just brings us back into coherence. Mm -hmm. And when we're in coherence, then we can be resilient. Mm -hmm. And the more resilient we are to get back to who we really are and get back to our authentic spiritual self, and trust that there's always a big picture to what's going on that is moving us toward the highest and best good. My God, for years I've preached chaos before transformation. But I, you know what? The Lord said it was easy to do that 20, 30 years ago because there wasn't a whole lot going on like now. <laughs> it was easy then. But now that I'm living it, I'm living the breakdown. I'm living the chaos. I'm, I'm living systems crumbling and becoming unstable. Just as I've been talking that for 30 years, it's a different thing to live it. This is why this is such a need for us to practice how to have heart live it, a life rather than just head life. Because if we don't, we're going to stay discouraged. We're going to stay depressed. We're going to be anxious. We're going to have all of these uh, attributes of, of, of the lower self, right? right? Mm -hmm. And we want to stay in the higher places. I want to share something that was interesting, but I noticed during the, uh, by the way, I want to thank all of you that was here yesterday. It was a fantastic experience. Oh my God. Woo, I've never seen this dancing. <laughs> Monday. Monday. Monday, yes, Monday. <laughs> it was good. I mean, we were in here, they were out there, it was all over the place. But it was, it was good. But uh, what was I going to say about that? Oh, I just noticed how people were talking about how 40 to 50 million people in this nation were all looking up at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I thought of my message that I do, where the disciples came to Jesus and said, there's earthquakes in places you can't imagine. There's nations rising against nations. It's bad out there. Is this the end? And Jesus said, look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. What an opportunity that for even a few minutes, enough of us looked up huh, and was not watching. 
what's going on in the media, what's going on in Israel or anywhere else. What an opportunity mm -hmm. like for, for Christ consciousness mm -hmm. to find a way in to the mass consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I know we've not seen anything fantastic happen, but I go back to the fact, look at the subtle. Mm -hmm. Whatever was the spiritual application of that eclipse, it will happen on a subtle level. If it's not an event, then all of a sudden. But just watch little things. Watch little moods change. Because I think it's a subtle thing that is basically happening. All right, we got 10 minutes to open up to you if you want to share or ask some questions. No? <laughs> it's about articulating. It's yes. I mean, my whole body is just vibrating, David. Thank you so much for it. all that you bring to us every time. Mm. And Thank you. I just know that there are things really happening on the cellular level. Mm. Yes. And it's a blessing. Thank you for that. Yes, I, I totally agree. Just that last night. Yes. I really appreciate the description of the heart math, which you know I have heard some of it before. But it really explains how I approach the world mm. my whole life. And I, and growing up, I never knew there were names or terminologies for it. Mm -hmm. But people in my family used to say things like, "You just." overly sensitive or mm -hmm. whatever, but I always knew what I knew. And then at a certain point, as you said, you talk yourself out of, yes, you know, yeah. and you go into this whole negative whatever, 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 but you realize whatever your first and impactful mm. in your body mm -hmm. that you felt, that is the truth. That's the immediacy of the truth. Mm -hmm. and, and I just accepted that's who I am. I know my truth. Nobody else may not agree with it or understand you know it, truth, yes, but right. I, I know my truth. Yes. And I sense it, I feel it, it, it is what it is. Very good. Hmm. I have uh, mentioned to you that I believe that uh, when, uh, when the Christ finally found a, a human, a way to get to the human story and incarnate 2,000 years ago, it did open a heart portal. If you think about every time you see anything of Jesus, it's the heart. Especially the Catholics are big. <laughs> and I think Jesus out there has got a heart thing going on. <laughs> we color chakra colors, but, <laughs> but I think there's a heart there. But there is that sacred heart thing. I, I'm not Catholic, so I don't understand that, but I know that's big uh, in, in a lot of religions. Why? Because he represents the portal for the heart to be open over the head, you know. Because as we, as we go back to um, even Buddhism and stuff like that, that's quite a study. To learn Buddhism and to go to these schools, it's a lifetime commitment to learn some of these things. Even Hinduism, all of these things are very learned, trained things that happen. And I think those who've come in through this portal, like you're talking about, because when you talk like that, I know you come in, you didn't have to learn it, you didn't have to name it, it was just there. And maybe for, for others of you, that you've always been more heart-driven. I don't even think you'd be here at Heartlight if you didn't have some heart. And I, I think that's why it's named Heartlight. When that name was given to me and I, heard that on the radio, I knew this had to be heart, which is a portal for the light to come through to the world. So. It's funny, there's a parallel too with Buddha, because Buddha is also very heart-focused beingness. And um, when they asked Buddha who will be the next Buddha, he said, you will. Yes. You all, you know, he understood. Mm -hmm. He was an enlightened man, and he understood what, what it was going to be 
that it wasn't going to be a bunch of successive Buddhas, I don't think. I think he understood mm -hmm. that just like Jesus woke up the Christ in all of us, mm -hmm. he woke up that enlightenment in all of us. Yes. 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 So each thing prepared for the next stage, mm -hmm. you know. And, and isn't the heart I sutras? can't hear you. Oh, the heart sutras. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. heart sutras, heart yes. songs, and oh, yeah, Buddhism too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, we got five more minutes, or you can get out early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know you want to get out in this beautiful day. <laughs> oh, yeah, so beautiful. <laughs> You said something earlier that I know it's in the Bible, but it, it came to me through the repassing or through the screening about this too shall pass when you were talking about what's This too shall pass. And again, <laughs> it shook me because when, it's, when that wording is coming from here, we're still focused on the stuff that's going on in here. But when it touches from the heart, it's coming from the heart. At least the couple of experiences that I've had, it just really stops me. Mm. And like, this is really the truth. And what you're sharing with how to get in that space, how to be resilient yes. Yes. so that you can respond to the what, the prayer for the what. Exactly. The well, put. well put. All right. Thank you. If you Thank want you. to share in uh, uh, the class, we'll receive our your love. <laughs> I always like for us to just take a few seconds to uh, digest, receive and take in whatever part of the talk that spirit is quickening into your consciousness. And today we take the teachings of this class and place it upon the altar of our higher self for processing, for discerning, for what part of it our consciousness meets that resonates and brings it into a personal experience of consciousness to expand itself. We ask it to be we thank you, Holy Spirit, because you are so willing to guide us, lead us, and share that deep whisper of the soul that whispers through our heart, even in the loudness of our brain, who oftentimes gets so loud and so distracting through prayer, through meditation and contemplation, we tune ourselves to the subtle sound of spirit to lead us, guide us, teach us, and keep us balanced in this time of such intensity of change and transformation. Today, we ask the blessings of El Elyon, the Most High God, Possessor of Heaven and Earth, of the Melchizedek Order, of an endless life, without mother, without father, without descent, as we stand as the tribe that gave no attendance at the altar. We are those who have been called into this time. Take a 
few deep breaths in your heart and exhale. And exhale. And exhale. Okay, when you're ready, you may return back to this room. Thank you so much for coming today and uh, hope to see you Sunday. Bye. Friday's Karen. Oh, Friday is Karen's. So. Oh, yeah. And board meeting for us board members. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh. We'll see you before you leave. And the garden. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I'll mention this today and tomorrow. The garden is not looking too good. So. Uh, is anybody interested in working with us in the garden? They want to find planting. some people who might be interested. And if not here, we'll ask Sunday again. Yeah. Come and see us if you think you might want to participate. We'll I don't know how much Michael is going to do or be able to do. I don't know what his plan is in the garden. But um, it's a nice garden. It's a shame to let it just go. I enjoyed the tomatoes last year. They were so good. I mean, we're happy to plant it, prep it and plant it, but we would need folks to help water it because we can't come here every day and right, just in the beginning right. to water it. Isn't there a timing or thing we can get? If there's a timer if there's a timer that we can get to set yeah, up. Yeah, that's we that's can a thought. Set up. All right, well so we'll see. Who wants to, who if wants the community to wants a garden, they'll step up. Say